We're in the middle of our summer sermon series. Say that real fast a couple times. The summer of love. We began with a definition of what love is, what love does, and what love doesn't do. And then we used that context of that agape love, that that unconditional, self-sacrificing, I don't care what it takes kind of love as described by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 7. Remember, we began by sharing you with that agape love, the same kind of love that God has shown to the world in John 3, 16. For God so agape loved the world that he gave us his son that we might have eternal life. It's the same kind of agape love that Jesus commands us to have in the great commandment that we're to love God, agape love with all we got, with our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And to love, agape love, our neighbors as ourselves. It's the same kind of love that Jesus said on the night before he was crucified. He said that all men, all people will know that you are my disciples if you agape, if you love one another. So what does Paul say what agape love is? 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Agape love is patient, it's kind. Agape love doesn't envy or boast. Agape love is not arrogant or rude. Agape love does not insist on its own way. Agape love is not irritable or resentful. Agape love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. You see, agape love never ends. Last two weeks, Pastor Randy has shared parts of that verse, that section of scripture, giving us the scriptures in the last two Sundays while I was on vacation. And by the way, I just got to tell you thank you for that opportunity to take a a once-in-a-lifetime trip to the Grand Canyon that that y'all gifted me last year to celebrate my 25th anniversary as a pastor. I haven't taken a vacation that long before. It's good to be back with y'all. I'm glad they didn't change the locks on the door, so thank you. (laughs) Appreciate that. Pastor Randy shared with us that love is patient, that agape love is kind. Last week he talked about that agape love does not envy. And as you remember, in 1 Corinthians 13, these words are written in context of 1 Corinthians 12, in which the Apostle Paul is talking about how the body of Christ is to function. Remember, Christ is the head of the body, and we're that body. And there's many different parts that make up that body. And, and each part is important as part of that body, and each part has to function depending on one another. And, and, then, and then Paul starts out with uh, the end of the chapter 12, verse 31a, and he says, and you know what, I'm going to now show you the most excellent way. And then he launches into 1 Corinthians 13. And he talks about how we are to live that, that love in the body of Christ as a church, in our homes, in our marriages, in our, in our families, with our kids, our grandkids, our coworkers, our community. And so this Sunday, I'd like to continue this study as we look at the next descriptor that Paul writes, that love is not easily angered. Or as you read this morning, love is not irritable, or resentful. Anybody get irritated this morning? I did. A couple times already. This is a hard one, y'all. Because if I were to ask you of all the human emotions you're capable of experiencing, this one seems, at least for me, the most difficult one to cope with. Because it is probably the most complex and challenging emotion that we face on a daily basis. You've got righteous anger, you've got unrighteous anger. But here's where we know from psychologists, therapists, counselors, anger is a gateway to so many other problems. I love what one, 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 one uh, psychologist wrote, 
Anger is one letter short of danger. I thought that was pretty good. It's a good warning to keep in mind because anger can cause a great deal of damage in our lives, in our homes, in our marriages, in our church, at work, you name it. And we're talking about whether it's rage, you know that intense, explosive, uncontrolled, fly off the handle anger. By the way, the Bible speaks about that. You don't have to look it up, but Proverbs 29, 11 says this, that a fool gives vent, full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. Or Proverbs 14, 17, a, a man of quick temper acts how? Yeah, been there, done that. People who express this kind of anger are walking time bombs, and they've got hair trigger tempers. They're ready to explode. You might even hear say, you know what? It may be that I lose my temper a lot, but you know what's really good about it? It's, it's, it's over within a few minutes. Well, by the way, so is a nuclear bomb. <laughs> a great deal of damage can happen in a very short time. So rage is something we've got to control. Wrath. I, I define that as, as anger that we want to retaliate, re have revenge, to retur return the hurt with or the injustice with, I'm going to even get them better. Proverbs 29, 22 talks about that. A man of wrath stirs up strife, and one given to anger causes much transgression. There's resentment. I mean, that's like something that builds over time, that stems from a grievance, and it allows it just to build and smolder and build and smolder. Oftentimes, resentment and anger doesn't blow up, it clams up. But it's grown inside of a person that produces bitterness that can be destructive to any relationship. We know that anger can cause relational problems. It can deal, be a part of the loss of a marriage or a family or friends. It can be a result of lawsuits, loss of job, damage to property, damage to other. It can even lead to murder. It, it has a variety of emotional problems associated with it. Anger can cause physical problems, high blood pressure, heart disease, headaches, stomach aches, ulcers, colitis, insomnia. Let me see if I can illustrate. Do you, do you remember, I mean, okay, you young and sorry, you're not gonna get it, it's okay. Do you remember the 1978 TV series, The Incredible Hulk? <laughs> you know, you may know this from the Marvel comic books of the 60s, but I'm not talking about the Avengers of, you know, like the Marvel series, okay? I'm going back to David Banner, or Bruce Banner. The 1978 TV series that I loved watching growing up. Each episode started like this. Dr. David Banner, physician, scientist, searching for a way to tap into the hidden strengths all the humans have. Then an accidental overdose of gamma radiation alters his body chemistry. And now when David Banner grows angry or outraged, a startling metamorphosis occurs. The creature is driven by rage and pursued by an investigative reporter, Mr. McGee. Mr. McGee. Hulk says, don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. The creature is wanted for murder. He didn't commit. David Banner is believed to be dead, and he must let the world think that he is dead until he can find a way to control the raging spirit that dwells within him. Man, that was every Friday night. It was just a good evening. 
The other interesting thing about Dr. David Banner is after his fits of rage, when his body transformed from that, or into that raging green monster called the Incredible Hulk, that when he would come back down, he morphs back into David, Dr. David Brenner, and he has no recollection of the destruction that he caused. And every time he, the Hulk finds himself getting angry for whatever reason, the transformation takes place. And one episode... As Banner is trying to reverse the process, he's talking with a fellow scientist, and here's what he says. Pay attention to this. I don't know who I am. I don't know what I'm becoming. But I know one thing for sure. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. You know... That green monster lives in every one of us. The Bible doesn't call it the Hulk. The Bible calls it sin. You see, there's this old sinful self living within each and every one of us, the old Adam, that old nature. And it's a sin that so oftentimes overwhelms us even, even when we know what we're supposed to do or what we're not supposed to do, I don't know who I am. I don't know what I'm becoming. But one thing is for sure, you wouldn't like me when I'm angry. Maybe it happens like this. You're in a rush to make a pivotal presentation. I mean, it's the next step up. It's your dream job. And you realize you've forgotten something. So you got to turn around. Someone caught you off on your return trip, pulls in front of you on an on-ramp, forces you to slow down and get in the other lane. You miss your exit. And then you realize not only have home, get home, you realize you've forgotten some other materials at the office. And you feel your blood pressure mounting and you happen to know an office depot at the next exit, you can still make it on time. If you get home quick, everything works out, you can get to office depot, you run in, you get your stuff, you get in line, the shortest line possible, and then all of a sudden you hear those dreaded words. Price check, register six. <laughs> and before you know it, the Hulk emerges. I don't know who I am. I don't know what I'm becoming. But I know one thing for sure. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. Maybe sit home. The kids are on your last nerve. House is a mess. Company's coming over in two hours. Spouse still isn't home. The caterer just called and said they're running two hours late. And it's about that time your spouse walks in completely oblivious to everything and announces they've invited two additional couples over for dinner and it's got to be extra special because they are some important people. I don't know who I am. <laughs> I don't know what I'm becoming. But I know for thing, one thing for sure, you're not going to like me when I get angry. Money is tight. The kids need new clothes. The washing machine goes out. And then the church starts some capital campaign and asks for more money. <laughs> I don't know who I am. <laughs> I don't know what I'm becoming. But one thing for sure, you wouldn't like me when I'm angry. Man, read the news, watch, or read the newspaper, watch the news. I mean, baseball games, batters crowding the plate, and pitcher's going to show them who's boss. Before you know it, he's hit, bench is clear. Soccer matches, man, there's some brawling going on in Central America. Political debates, oh, there's never a problem there. Facebook, I don't know who I am. 
I don't know what I'm becoming, but I know for one thing for sure, you won't like me when I'm angry. You get the point. You see, anger is something that all of us can deal, identify with. But I like to say anger is a, is a neutral emotion. It's neither good nor bad. It's how we express that emotion that determines whether it is righteous or unrighteous. You see, God gave each of us in our biological makeup the capacity to get angry. So anger is not necessarily a sin. Hmm. It's how we manage it or control it that makes all the difference. And by the way, every one of us in this room right now, I would say everyone, 95% of us, how about that, have the possibility to manage and control our anger. You know what I mean? Think about it. Have you ever been in a heated argument with your kids or with your spouse? I mean, you're just going off. You're just... And then the phone rings. You say, hello. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> oh, it's great. <laughs> yes, we're having... Oh. Click. And why did you continue... Turn to Matthew chapter 5. First book of the New Testament. Well, I better hurry up here. I'm out of time almost. Matthew chapter 5. If you're using the Bibles in front of you, it's on page 810. Jesus says, Ye have heard that it was said to those of old, You should not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Previously, in, 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 in verse 20, Jesus said that our righteousness has to surpass that of the scribes and Pharisees. What's amazing, he begins this sermon by dealing with anger. And that opening phrase, you have heard, it actually takes us back to an Old Testament law, the Fifth Commandment. And at this point, the listeners might have said, yeah, we got it, we get it. We're not supposed to murder anybody. We're well-behaved, we're not murderers. We're not guilty, we're good. Good moral, ethical people. Preach on, preacher. But then Jesus presses in. And there's a mic drop moment, verse 22. But I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister, will be liable to judgment. And whoever insults his brother will be liable to the counsel. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. One commentator I read wrote, Jesus is affirming everything in the Old Testament, but he's also fulfilling it. That is, he is filling it full of meaning. What is implicit in the Old Testament law Jesus is making explicit. He said, I'm going to give you the very heart of the law to show you how you can live it out in its deepest meaning. Moving from the fruit, of, the, the fruit of murder to the root of murder. An evil heart. And Jesus is reminding each of us that we've been guilty. Guilty of murder because we've been angry in our words and our thoughts, our attitudes, our actions. You know, this is why it's so important that we rely daily on the grace and mercy of Jesus. Why it's so vitally important that you come today to receive Christ's body and blood, that you might be filled with the very presence of Jesus offering you his forgiveness that we might live the life he calls us to live. Verse 23, Jesus says, so if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. 
Jesus is talking to us how we can how we can deal with the green monster inside of each one and every one of us. If you want to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4, it was read this morning by Phyllis. It's Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 is on page 978. Verse 26 says, Be angry. What? But it says, be angry and do not sin. You see, there is righteous anger. Jesus showed it when he was turning the tables in the temple. Paul is saying, it's okay to be angry, just don't sin. By the way, I haven't figured out yet how to do that. I'm still in process. Do not let the sun go down in your anger. Why? Give no opportunity to the devil. Or another translation says, don't give the devil a foothold into your life. You see, that's what anger does. And so look at Paul says later on in verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. What's Paul saying? So we begin every day at the foot of the cross, marveling at the amazing grace that God has sent to us, his own son, to bear the wrath that we deserve. And then we begin to live it out with others. Don't hear me saying that means you sweep conflict under the rug. No, what it means is you deal with the conflict and you put a layer of holiness between you and the other person. It means forgiving others just as in Christ God forgave you. But I don't want to. I'm telling you all, you can be mad at your dad for the rest of your life for not being there in your childhood. You can be mad at your mom. You can be mad at a friend. You can be mad at somebody else. And, and, and if they ever came up to you and said, what can I do to make it up to you? The reality is there is nothing they can do. You can't go back the eight years. You can't go back to the graduation you missed. You can't go back and relive the pain that you experienced. If we're really honest ourselves, you you, you can't pay me back. Maybe, Maybe you're struggling right now because your spouse left you for someone else. They, they, they can't make that up to you. That vow destroyed. Maybe, maybe you're dealing with someone who's destroyed your reputation. Maybe someone who made it so bad for you that you had to change schools, leave town, get a different job. They can come back and say they're sorry, but it's not going to give you reputation back. Maybe there's something in your childhood that was so horrific, abuse, abandonment, whatever it may be. You can't go back and pretend it didn't happen. So if it can't be repaid, it can't be made up, what do we do? Well, look how Ephesians chapter 5 begins. Man, if if we could live verses 1 and 2 in chapter 5, Paul writes, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved or dearly loved children and walk in agape as Christ agape us and gave himself up for us as a sacrifice, fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So what do you do? 
What's some practical things you can do today to deal with your anger? And here's the first thing. Confess your anger as a sin to Christ. Ask God to help you. Forgive the person who's offended you. Deal quickly with your anger so it doesn't turn into bitterness. And then I'd say surround yourself with other godly Christians who can help manage you or help manage their anger in godly ways. And if a situation is so bad, seek professional help. If you're struggling with it, I invite you to email Pastor Randy, then he'll give you a list of resources. And, and, and I want you to hear. I struggle with this guy every day. Every day. I'll be a little vulnerable with you. I even went to therapy because of it. Every day. I want y'all to know we can't overcome the green guy by ourselves. It's by God's grace, through his Holy Spirit, that we live as his forgiven, redeemed children, filled with his presence, his body and his blood, realizing that there's gonna be days we fail. But there's also days where we stop and ask for forgiveness to start anew that we can live out the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, I know I'm missing one other one. Galatians 5.26, look it up. I'll leave you with this, Colossians 3.12. Put on them. That means get dressed every day. As God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, Put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. And above all, put on these virtues, put on this love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. It's time to put the green guy away. May God grant that to each of us. For Jesus' sake. To God alone be the glory.